In this video, I'd like to discuss how to encode states from our finite state machines. So if you remember from previous videos, um, if we have a finite state machine specified out, um, before we can implement it into a circuit, I have to encode the states. I have to assign binary values to each of the individual states so that I can track the current state, which is stored in a register, a series of flip-flops, and determine the logic right, for what my next state is going to be, as well as the output of a particular circuit. Um, so there are actually two approaches to encoding states that I would like to talk to you about. We're going to run through two examples on this particular finite state machine. So this finite state machine, you see the transitions are all marked with X's, which means we don't care about the input. Essentially, there is no input to this finite state machine. This finite state machine is just going to keep cycling through forever and ever and ever and ever. Um, so I start here in state 0, where I can see that the output is true, right? And then I move to state 1 and then state 2, and then finally back to state 0. And it doesn't matter what the input is. There, there could be no input whatsoever. It does not matter to us. I'm just going to keep cycling through. I'm just going to keep wrapping through each of these states in series forever um, to infinity. So I have this very simple finite state machine. The question then becomes, how do I encode these states? Well, let's take a look at the first option. The first option is to assign a binary number to each of these particular states. I have three states right, in this particular finite state machine, which means I cannot assign a number to each one unless I have at least two bits of, of, uh, in my binary values. One bit is not enough, so I need at least two bits. And so I might assign numbers uh, as follows. So state 0 might be 0, 0, state 1 might be 0, 1, and state 2 might be 1, 0. And so then the next thing to consider is how do I transition from one state to the next? Well, I can write a logic equation for each one of these bits. So bit 0, for example, is going to be true, right? Again, we have to consider the next clock cycle, right? So looking at the values from the previous clock cycle, which is going to be, you know, coming from state 1, state 2, bit 0 will be true if bit 0 is false and bit 1 is true. Right? And then similarly, bit 1 will be true if in the previous clock cycle, bit 0 is false and bit 1 is also false. So I can write out right, those particular logic equations. I can also write out a logic equation for the output. The output is only true in one case, which is state 0. So if I call my output y, that means that y will only be true if bit 0 is false and bit 1 is false. And so I can write those equations out as follows. Now again, be careful, I'm defining bit 1 in terms of bit 1, but remember this is bit 1 in the next clock cycle is dependent on bit 1 of the current clock cycle, right? And bit 0 for the next clock cycle is dependent on bit 0 for the current clock cycle, right? So um, be aware of that distinction, it, it's uh, very important. And so here I see these logic equations, right? I see these three logic equations, and I can actually implement these. I can create a circuit for these. It's pretty simple since I don't really have any other inputs to worry about. Uh, a corresponding circuit might look something like this. You see I have two flip-flops. I need two flip-flops, one for each bit, right? So here is bit 0, here is bit 1. And so then what I have is the uh, logic over here to determine the output, which is y, which is you know, not b0 and not bit 1. I'm feeding that actually back into bit 0. If you remember our uh, logic equations from the previous slide, I say the next value for bit 0 is equal to not bit 1 and not bit 0. That's exactly what I have here. And then the logic equation for bit 1 says not bit 1 and bit 0. So here you see the logic for that particular um, state on this side of the circuit. And so this circuit actually implements the finite state machine. This is, this is the entire circuit that we need to implement this particular finite state machine. Right? So that is one way of encoding our states. Just assign a binary number, determine how many bits you need, and then start assigning binary numbers to the individual states. Um, how you assign those binary numbers actually matters a great deal. Uh, the Zybook goes into more detail about that. Uh, I'm not going to go into any more detail about that on this particular set of slides. But um, you can actually make more efficient circuits depending on how you assign those binary values as well. So let's talk about the second way of assigning um, values to these particular states. The other way 
of assigning encodings to particular states in my finite state machine is called one-hot encoding. And here's what it looks like, right? I have three states, and over here in this chart, you can see the binary encodings for each of these, where only one binary signal is going to be high at any particular point in time. That's where the one-hot name comes from. And so in this particular encoding scheme, I'm going to have one bit for each state in my finite state machine. Here I have three states, right? So I'm going to have one bit for each of those states, or three bits total. And I need to write out my logic circuits again. I need to write out my uh, logic expressions so that I can turn them into a circuit. And so again, I need to consider what is the next value of a bit depending on, depending on the previous value. So if I look at uh, bit 1, for example, I can see that bit 1 will be true if b0 is true on the previous cycle. And if b0 is false on the previous cycle, then b1 will be false. Right? Same thing for bit 2. Bit 2 is going to be whatever the previous value of bit 1 is. And bit 0 is going to be whatever the previous value of bit 2 is. Right? As far as the output goes, the output will be true as long as I'm in state 0. So if I see that bit 0 is high, then my output should also be high. So those logic expressions look something like this, right? Remember, again, this means that the next value for b0 is equivalent to the current value of b2. The next value of b1 is equivalent to the current value of b0. And the next value of b2 is equivalent to the current value of b1, right? So then if we take a look at our results here, if we take a look at how to code this circuit up, how to make this circuit work, it might look something like this. I have three flip-flops, one for each bit, b0, b1, and b2, and you can see that in each case I just take the output and feed it into the next flip-flop. The output of b0 goes into b1, the output of b1 goes into b2, and the output of b2 wraps around and goes back into b0. The output of b0 is also connected directly to the output of the circuit. Why? So compare and contrast, right, this circuit with the one that we saw with our binary encoding on the previous slide. Now if we take a look at the number of gates, right, and the number of transistors, we're always trying to minimize the number of, of gates that we have in our particular circuits. Uh, a D flip-flop has 10 gates in it. So this particular circuit here with the binary encoding uses 10, 20, and then I've got 3 over here and 2 over here, so 25 gates total. If I look at the circuit that I um, use with the one-hot encoding, you see I, I only have three flip-flops. I have no other logic gates whatsoever. So that's going to be 10, 20, 30 gates total. Um, so it looks like in terms of number of gates used that the binary encoding will win in this particular case. That will not always be true. Sometimes the one-hot encoding will result in a circuit that uses fewer gates and fewer transistors than the binary encoding will. However, I would still say there's a pretty strong argument for using one-hot encoding uh, for this particular circuit. Even though it does use more gates, it's a significantly simpler circuit than uh, the binary encoding circuit that we looked at. And so you cannot um, you know, de-emphasize how important it is for our circuits to be simple and easy to understand. This one, I would argue, is easier to understand than this one, even though it uses less logic. Um, so, gate count alone is not the only determining factor for our circuit, but uh, definitely is a very important factor to take into consideration. So that wraps it up in terms of encoding states. Uh, I'll see you in the next video.